Greetings in the name of Christ. I'm Walter Meyer III. We will be going over the Old Testament reading for Proper 11. That reading is Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. First, we will go through the Hebrew text, translate, and then a few thoughts by way of exegetical analysis. So stepping over here to the Hebrew text, Hoy, Roim, woe to the shepherds. The word here, shepherds, very important in this pericope from the verb ra'a, resh, ay, and he. This is a call participle, and it's taking on the function of a noun. Woe to the shepherds, and then the verb avath, pl, participle, who are destroying. The verb putz is next. This is a hifil participle, and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declaration of Yahweh. Going to the next verse. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, or thus Yahweh has said, Yahweh, the God of Israel. All haroim, concerning the shepherds, there's that same word again as we had in verse 1, concerning the shepherds, who are shepherding or tending eth ami, my people. And then what does Yahweh say? You have scattered. And so we have again the verb putz here as a hip feel. Uh, notice that we have here the independent subject pronoun appearing and before the verb, this is for emphasis. You have scattered my flock and you have banished them. This is from the verb nadach. Uh, this also is a hifil, and it means banish, thrust out. You have thrust them out. And you now the verb pakad, that means attend to, and you have not attended to them, or you have not tended them. Now, hini, behold, I am attending to Concerning you, Allah am concerning you, the evil of your deeds, declaration of Yahweh. Let me go over that phrase again. Behold, I am attending to, concerning you, the evil of your deeds, declaration of Yahweh. Next verse here. And I will gather the remnant of my flock. Notice again the independent subject pronoun, ani, appearing and before the verb, and that's for emphasis. And I will gather the remnants of my flock from all the lands, now literally, which I banish them. So again, the verb, nadak, I banished them, otham, there. Now, smoothing that out a little bit, from all the lands to which I banished them. And now going down below here, and I will restore them, or I will return them to, and then we have the word for uh, abode of the sheep, uh, fold with the suffix, to their fold, and they will be fruitful. Can you please raise this now? And they will be fruitful, so from the verb para, and they will be and they will multiply, so from the verb rava, and they will become many. Now the next verse, from the verb kum. And again we have a hifil here, and I will raise up over them roim, shepherds. And they will shepherd them, or you could say they will tend them, and they will not be afraid. So from the verb yare, anymore, oath, again. And they will not be dismayed. This is from the verb chatat, and this is a call. They will not be dismayed, and they will not be. Now, again, we have the verb pakad, but this time it is a nifal imperfect. And as a nifal, it has this nuance, uh, be lacking, be missing. 
and they will not be missing declaration of Yahweh. Now the next verse, and now we're getting to the key messianic prophecy. Behold, days are coming, declaration of Yahweh. And again, this verb, kum, in the hifiel, and I will raise up for David, so the verb kum, uh, to rise, but now the hifiel causes the stand, I will cause the stand, or raise up for David, a righteous branch, so tzemach, branch, sadiq, righteous. And a king will rule and uh, do wisely. The verb sakal here in the hifiel can mean to do wisely or it can mean to prosper. So either one is fine in this context. And then asa, and he will do, or a little better English, and he will execute justice, mishpat, and sadaqah, righteousness, in the land. Can you please raise it again? In his days, so we have the word here, yom, with the preposition and then the suffix, in his days, Judah will be saved. So the verb yasha, uh, this is a nifal, will be saved, and Israel, shakan, will dwell securely. And this is his name, which one will call him. Uh, we can see that as the Hebrew impersonal, which he will be called, and now the name, Yahweh Sidkenu, Yahweh our righteousness. All right, thus far with the translation of the text, and now some thoughts by way of exegetical analysis uh, with regard to verse 1. Uh, this is set against the background of the preceding chapter in which God was dealing with wicked kings of Judah. And those kings and other leaders in the land were giving poor leadership to the people. They were wicked and having a bad influence on the people. Uh, the people of Israel referred to as the sheep, as the flock. And they were scattered. Uh, the wicked leaders led the people astray, and so God's judgment had to come. And that was fulfilling what God promised, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, for the people having covenant unfaithfulness. And we know what the scattering meant. Uh, uh, first of all, with regard to the northern kingdom, that kingdom coming to an end, and then many people being taken off into exile. And now also in the southern kingdom, some people having already been taken off into exile, but more of that would be taking place. And again, this is the righteous judgment of Yahweh. This judgment from Yahweh had to come about because the people were wicked, and in large measure that was due to the wicked leadership. And so verse 2, God will punish these wicked leaders. Verse 3, God will gather the remnant of his flock. And again, the flock, the sheep referring to the people of Israel. Uh, God scattered them because his judgment had to come, but now he would gather the remnant uh, from God's judgment. Uh, from exile, there emerged a purified remnant, something that the prophet Isaiah had foretold. And this remnant then made up of believers. And God says then that he would return them to their pasture or to their fold. And so this is figurative for God bringing them back from exile and bringing them back to the land where the population would once again increase. So God brings back this purified remnant to the native land. Verse 4, God would give to his flock restored in the land, this purified remnant. He would give to them good leaders. Uh, these are spiritual leaders 
who would tend them spiritually in the proper way and have good influence on the people. And the people then would be safe from the spiritual standpoint. And then verse 5, behold, this is a marker in the text indicate what follows is an important announcement. Days are coming. And that phrase takes us then into the New Testament era. Declaration of Yahweh. So again, marking this as an important pro proclamation from Yahweh. Yahweh, the covenant God, the God who keeps his word, the covenant God who promised to send the Messiah. I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This coming one foretold here would be a descendant of David, 2 Samuel 7. And this coming one would be a righteous branch, a righteous descendant. And so branch is a word used elsewhere for the coming Messiah, indicating that he would be you know, from the family of David. And he would be righteous. You know, strong contrast to the corrupt leaders of Judah in Jeremiah's day, those described in chapter 22 and at the beginning of chapter 23. This coming one would be perfectly righteous. He would be holy without sin. And all that he would do would be just and perfect. He would also be a king and he would rule. And so this is the messianic king referring to his messianic kingdom which endures forever. And so this is his spiritual kingdom. Now this messianic king will do wisely or he will prosper, either one, either translation is fine. And this is because of his supernatural wisdom and also his being totally righteous. And so he'd be able to deal effectively with his enemies, defeat them, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And this is a reference to his redeeming work, but also then his work, ongoing work, after his resurrection and ascension into heaven. And he will execute justice and righteousness in the land. Some debate about this phrase, in the land. But again, all that he does is just and righteous. Now that phrase, in the land, in this context, and in view of verse 8, I see this as a reference to the land Galilee and Samaria and Judea. In other words, the land of Israel. And that's where the Messiah began to carry out his ministry. And thus we have his rule, but now he's ruling over Israel and Judah. And... These two entities, Israel and Judah, will dwell securely. Now, this is not a secular political reunification of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Rather, this is a spiritual reunification. This is talking about believers. And this is the Messiah's spiritual kingdom. So spiritual Judah, spiritual Israel. And... Again, uh, this is taking those two words in context. So in this pericope, pasture and land mean one thing. Judah and Israel mean something else. And again, I give this interpretation in light of verse 8 and also verse 7. So the spiritual kingdom of the Messiah. Now, there will be salvation. Uh, Judah, Israel will be saved. Uh, this is spiritual salvation, spiritual deliverance, saved from sin, death, and the devil. And spiritual Judah and spiritual Israel will dwell securely. Those in the spiritual kingdom of the Messiah are safe from spiritual enemies. And they have freedom from fear, want, and danger. They have spiritual protection and provision. They have spiritual peace. And then finally, and this is his name, which one will call him. So this is a reference to the Messianic king, this branch of David. He will be called Yahweh, our 
righteousness. That is the translation which I go with. And what we have here is a powerful messianic prophecy. So this messianic king is directly called Yahweh. Even though he is a branch of David, a descendant of David, he nevertheless is Yahweh. And also Yahweh, our righteousness. And with that phrase, the chief doctrine is brought to the foreground. The chief doctrine, and that is justification by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He is our righteousness. He acquired this righteousness for us with his holy life and then with his innocent suffering and death. And this righteousness is available to all and is received through faith. So therefore, once again, the chief doctrine. Brothers, I hope this has been a profitable time for you and that you can use some of these thoughts and the translation as you prepare a sermon or a Bible study. This is a beautiful messianic passage. May God bless your meditation on this text and your use of it. The Lord be with you.